Warning, I'm about to go on a rant. You are listening to the Life Coach School podcast with Brooke Castillo, episode number 191. Welcome to the Life Coach School podcast, where it's all about real clients, real problems, and real coaching. And now your host, Master Coach Instructor, Brooke Castillo. All right, I'm warning y'all. I'm about to go on a rant right now. (laughs) This podcast is about actions in spite of negative emotion. And when I originally wrote up the content and the outline for this, I wasn't thinking about work ethic, but now I am. I have a ridiculously strong work ethic. And so does my husband. So I think sometimes we think everybody is like us because we like to work. Like we like to put our heads on the pillow at night and be like, hell yeah, we slayed it today. There's something about contributing, working, using ourselves up that we just both love, 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 love. And we've always been that way. Chris and I met when we were working at Hewlett Packard and he was actually my trainer at Hewlett Packard. And I went and got a job. Remember I joined the weird cult thing and then I didn't have any money. So I went and got a job and that's where I met my husband. So you just never know giving all your money away to a cult may be the best thing that ever happened to you. It was for me. But anyway, Got a job at Hewlett Packard and we went to work when we went to Hewlett Packard. You know, it's a corporate job. I went, I did my job, I worked hard, I put in tons of extra time and loved it. So, anyway, so I think that Chris and I, we work hard in our home, we work hard for our family, we work hard at whatever job we have, whatever project we're working on, and we work hard in our business. Now, a lot of people think that means that we have to sacrifice other things or that we're always exhausted or always stressed, and that's not the case. We just like to work. Chris grew up, his dad was a butcher, and his dad put him to work in the grocery store and taught him how to clean and do a good hard day's work. I started working at the ranch that I was riding my horse at. I started working when I was like 10 And what's really interesting about my upbringing, I think because I spent the majority of my time at the ranch, is that I was exposed to a lot of different things than I would have been had I just stayed at home. We had money. I was born with a silver spoon for sure. And we had a lot of money. So we didn't, my mom didn't work and she had inherited money from my grandfather. Not a lot, but enough that she didn't have to work. And we lived in a nice house. We actually lived in a a condo after my parents got divorced. It was beautiful and it was nicely decorated. And my mom was able to buy us pretty much anything that we wanted. We went on beautiful vacations, that sort of thing. But then most of the time that I was awake, I was at the barn. And I spent a lot of time with the employees that worked at the barn. And I remember specifically, Jose was like my buddy (laughs) at the barn. And he was the guy in charge of cleaning all the horses' stalls and making sure that the saddles were put away and everything like that. And so it was my dream. I remember when I was really young, like my dream was to be able to have Jose's job because he got paid to work with the horses. So we spent, I spent so much time working. Like we wanted to, I was a trail guide. And so we would clean up after the horses. We would saddle the horses. We'd wash the horses. We would, I remember we would weed the hills. There was uh what is that called? Ice plant on the hills. <laughs> we would weed the hills. I wanted to teach camp. I worked my butt off in the gloriness of it, right? I just learned from Lynn, who was my boss, and Jose, who had like the most amazing work ethic of anyone. And all of us that worked at the barn, we just worked. Like I remember at lunch, we would be starving because we had worked so hard. And 
I went to bed at night and I would be like raw, like seriously, like under my armpits, I would be raw from shoveling and cleaning and raking. We always used to have to rake. It's crazy thinking about it now. Like it was hard manual labor I did and just loved it. And so I think that's when I really learned to love working. And I always wanted to work. I think probably because my mom didn't work and she looked bored. (laughs) I always wanted to make my own money. I always wanted to work. I always felt that sense of contribution. So I think that's where I got my work ethic. And I think that Chris got his from working with his dad in the butcher shop. And so when we met each other, we, I think, really clicked because we just like to work. We just like to make things awesome. And for me, I think one of the reasons why I was so successful at Hewlett Packard is because I was always, I think when I was growing up at the barn, I was always in service to the customer, always in service to my boss, always helping Jose. So it was always kind of like I was the employee serving the employer and always wanting to please and always wanting to do a good job. I was, I've always been such a pleaser. And so I think that was another thing is like, I always wanted to get that approval, do a good job and get that approval. And so when I went to Hewlett Packard, it was the same thing. Like I, my first job actually was at Chevy's. I could not wait to get my work permit. I could not, I mean, seriously, I wanted my work permit more than I wanted my driver's license. I was so excited to get my work permit. And uh, I worked at a restaurant called Chevy's. So awesome. Lots of drugs. (laughs) That wasn't so awesome, but I worked my butt off at Chevy's and loved it. And I always wanted a job. I got a job at Nordstrom and was immediately the, you know, best salesperson there. People would always complain about work. I never did. I loved working. I always just wanted to work. And what was crazy is before I joined the cult, before I got into that situation, I didn't need any money. I didn't need to work for money. I just wanted to work. I just wanted to make a contribution. Okay. So I'm telling you all of this because I want you to understand that I have an amazing work ethic and so does Chris. And so we think everyone else does. And what we're learning is that not everyone else has the same work ethic that we do. And I want to tell you that if you are someone that doesn't have an amazing work ethic, that it's worth developing one. Not for the person that you're working with, not for their sake, but for your sake. Because here's what I've discovered, and especially recently, because we just moved to Dallas. So we have this home that we've had to hire people to work on, a lot of people to work on. And at the same time, I've been hiring a lot of people to work in my company. And so at the same, so we've just been doing a crazy amount of hiring, whether it's contractors to work on the house or people to work in the company or work for me personally or whatever. So I'm really discovering that there are people who think they have a good work ethic. They think that they work hard and they don't, and they don't realize that they don't work hard. (laughs) So I'll give you a tale of two contractors. I hired this company called, should I give you their names? I'll give you the name of the great company, but I hired a pool company to do my pool and they did a great sales job, did this really cool rendering of this pool that I'm going to have. And I was super excited about the pool. And this is what I said to the guy. I said, Hey, listen, I said, every single time someone's had a pool built, one of my friends or, or acquaintances, they always tell me what a nightmare it is. They end up just being so frustrated. Seriously, every single person. I've never had someone say, oh, that was an amazing pool building experience. I really enjoyed it. (laughs) Like everyone's always complaining. So I said to the guy, I said, listen, I don't want to hate you after this. I want this to be a smooth process. So here's what I want to do. I want to give you $2,000 that you can use to make sure that there aren't any delays, to make sure we're, we're like the first in line, that everything is on time, that everything gets taken care of and that we're kind of your VIP customer. So he agreed to do that. That was brilliant. So we hire him. We say, hey, let's get the pool started. And he's like, yeah, we got inspections. We got to do this. We got to do that. There was like all these things that had to happen. So we started doing them. We got them done. And then we were ready to go, right? We're like, hey, 
ready to go. We got the inspection for the pool done. Let's start digging a hole. And I could tell right away (laughs) that we were all on a different page about the urgency and the schedule and how things were going to be done and in what order and that sort of thing. And just there was a, a, and a tremendous sense of urgency up front for the sales process to get me to make my deposit. And then after that, they totally lost me because there was no good planning, no good efficiency. The schedule was off. The sense of urgency was terrible. I said to the guy who is a different guy than that sold me, I said, hey, why aren't we moving forward. What are we waiting on? He said, oh, we're waiting on some pool equipment. And I said, well, that's weird because we've been waiting three months for an inspection. Why didn't we order the pool equipment then? He's like, oh yeah, we did, but some of the stuff hasn't come in yet. I said, okay, so like, where is it? He's like, I I, I don't know. And I said, okay, well, do we have a ship date on it? Do we have a tracking number? He's like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I said, okay, well, can we find out? is there someone I can talk to is like UPS, like I'm happy to call on all that stuff. Like, I don't want my pool being delayed because we don't have a shipment of something that doesn't make any sense to me. And he like looked at me like this lady is crazy pressuring me to go find this equipment. And he's like, yeah, well, we'll get it in a couple of days. I said, but why would we wait a couple of days? I don't understand. Why would we wait a couple of days and delay our pool build a couple of days because something hasn't come? What if maybe it didn't get ordered? What, like, shouldn't we find out where it is? And he just stared at me like, whoa, like settle down, lady. <laughs> Which I'm used to that look, by the way. <laughs> I get it a lot of the time. Settle down, lady, slow your roll. Everything's gonna be fine. So I was like, you gotta be kidding me. So I called the original guy who sold me the pool and I was like, dude, he actually owns the pool company. I'm like, there is no reason why we should be dealing with delays for shipments. Like who is managing all of this and who's making sure that we're as efficient as possible and that my pool can get done before we get into rainy season? Like who's looking over it? And he said, hey, you got to talk to the guys in construction. Like not my job. I just own the place. And so I said, fine, that's fine. As long as you got a good guy in construction, I'm happy to do that. Let's talk to a guy in construction. He doesn't know what's going on with my pool equipment. No idea. I said, that's okay. I understand you're probably not the pool equipment guy, but can we find out who knows what's going on with my pool equipment? Let's not pass the buck. And especially to the customer. Like for me, I feel like, hey, could you figure this out and get back to me? Instead of me calling everybody around. It's like really fascinating to me. It's kind of like, hey, not my job. Hey, not my job. And this has just been one thing after the other, right? So first it was the pool equipment, then the guys just not showing up and then them delaying. And then we didn't pass an inspection because someone didn't do a quality job and then somebody didn't follow up, right? It was just one thing after the other. So I called the business owner guy and I was like, hey man, I run my own company, I understand, but this is really inefficient. You guys aren't following up. There's no attention to us. There's no customer service. We're just supposed to deal with this really low standard of work and urgency and missing inspections and that sort of thing. And he was like, whoa, like we're going to still be, you know, fine in terms of the schedule. Why are you pushing? And, and you know, everything's going to be all right. Just chill. And so it got me thinking about this difference between, hey, it's all going to get done, chill. And like, dude, let's get the job done. So let's contrast that with Kevin Keen. Kevin Keen's business is one of the most extraordinary businesses I've ever done business with. And I know I've talked to you guys a little bit about them on the podcast, but here's what I want to talk about. Guy came to my door. All I wanted him to do is mow and blow the yard. Came to the door, said, happy to mow and blow the yard. We'll do it right now. But I just want to give you some other options on what we can do for your landscaping. Would that be okay with you? I just want to get a sense of what you want. So I said, sure, gave him a sense of what I wanted. He went out to his car, wrote up a landscape plan, came back out, told me how much it was going to cost. I said, yes, it was done the next day. Now, if any of you guys have had landscape done, that's just not heard of, right? And it was funny because we told someone else about it. He goes, oh, well, he, they must not have much business if they were able to get that out there the next day. That's ridiculous, Right. They must be really hungry for business. And the opposite is true. 
this company, Kevin Keene's landscape company, is killing it. They are multi millions of dollar company killing it because they know how to go to work. They came out, they gave me a design that minute and designed my landscape and then installed it the next day. Now it took them actually three days. I shouldn't say they installed it the next day. Over the next three days, they installed all of my landscape. Now here's what happened. All of my neighbors were like, what? Lori across the street who has been waiting six months to get her landscape in came over and was like, what is going on? I can't believe you got your landscape done so fast. It looks so great. Amazing, right? So I said to Kevin, I'm like, dude, you are one of the most extraordinary businesses I've ever done business with. And uh, he's like, yeah, we just get it done. We just do our jobs and we just get it done. And I was like, right? And I looked at him and I was like, see, he's like, I'm Irish. (laughs) I was like, all right, but you know how to run a company. You know how to do the best job you can. And he's just super stoked, happy guy, happy to do business. Now I called him. I had to complain about something. He's like, I will solve this for you in 10 seconds. Like he was all over solving the problem. So I had that experience. It was really fascinating to watch the difference between just the immediacy, the hard work, the energy, the time put into taking care of the customer versus my pool guy who's just really just doing his job, not going above and beyond, just kind of doing, hey, this is how long it takes to build a pool. Chill out. So different. So now, by the way, I've told everyone about, there's 100,000 people that listen to this podcast. They all know about Kevin now. You guys all know about Kevin. If you live in this local area, you'll probably hire Kevin because he's amazing. My neighbor immediately hired Kevin. Anyone who will let me talk to them about landscape, I talk about Kevin. My mom wants to hire Kevin. She lives in California. We're like, Kevin, fly fly everyone down. Like It's so amazing how his work ethic is so fantastic. He's so on top of it. He wants to work hard. He wants to do a good job, wants to go above and beyond that he doesn't even really have to market. I'm like marketing for him. Now, I want to dial this back and apply it to people, individuals. And how many of us actually go to work? How many of us actually put our head on the pillow at the end of the day and are like, damn. Now there's two differences. And I want to talk about this. There's a difference between pushing yourself and burning out and buzzing around and working yourself in a frenzy and being exhausted because you don't like your life and you aren't producing anything that feels valuable to you. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about that kind of exhaustion. I'm talking about the exhaustion where you go and you work and you get it done and you high five yourself at the end of the day. Like you're Kevin, you go, you get a new customer and you install their landscape the next day and they're delighted. That's the kind of work I'm talking about. I'm talking about you go out there and you do a Facebook live and you're a brand new coach and you get two new clients from it. You're like, damn, good for me. That's the kind of work that I'm talking about. I'm talking about being willing to serve. So Chris and I were having this conversation because a lot of times we hire someone to work for the life coach school And they come into the school feeling like ready and capable and excited. And they come in, we say at about 50% of our expectation, but that's what they've been running at considering that they're hundred percent. So like we have a guy that we hired and we love him so much. He's like huge asset to our company. We're giving him a huge bonus this week just because we love him and he's so awesome. But he came into this business kind of with this eight to five attitude, like basically like, Hey, tell me what to do and I'll do it. And I'll just do my job. I said, listen, buddy. I said, that's not going to fly here. These are the results we want you to produce. It's not eight to five. You just come in and toil away. You come in, you do your job in two hours. You can go home. We're not tracking your hours. You do your job in, you know, 60 hours. That it's not our business. You get to decide how efficient and hard you're going to work and what you're going to do. But here's the result we expect. And I will tell you, he came in probably the first two weeks. <laughs> he was like, holy moly, you guys are nuts. But he got up to speed and now he's just like killing it for us. So amazing. Such a great hard worker. And I think, you know, I don't know this is true, but I think at the end of the day, dude knows he like went to work. 
He like feels it and he loves working. And my assistant, Rebecca, when I first hired her, (laughs) she, I gave her some work to do and it took her a while to do it. And I said to her, oh no, I think we're confused. I need you to do all of that in about half the time. And you know what she said? She said, all right, I'm on it and did it. And she is like doubled down on the amount of work she can do in a certain amount of time. And she is so extraordinary. And I love, love, love having her work for me because she's just, we're like there on the same page. She does such great work, does it so quickly. It's like so awesome to work with people who kick ass. I love it. And then I've had some people come work for me, even just contractors or people working in the house that think they're working really hard. They're like coming and they're like doing their best and they need to take like breaks. <laughs> Actually, Rebecca and I were talking about this and I was saying, you know, I think most people don't know what they're in for when they sign up to work for me. And she goes, yeah, she goes, listen, she goes, most people go to work. You got get to work. And the first thing you do is you get a cup of coffee and you sit down, you have a little conversation with the person next to you. Then you got to check what's on Facebook. Then you got to spend some time reading your email. And she goes, I don't have time for any of that. She goes, I, I put my head down. I go to work and then I'm done. Day's over. Boom. I just produced work. And I think it's really important for me to understand this work ethic thing because when I'm training students to be life coaches, I think it's important for me to understand when I talk about working hard and talk about a work ethic, a lot of people don't know what that means. Like I have people coming to work for me who think they are hard workers, who think they produce a lot. And they're at about like a 30% capacity, 30% of what their potential is, of what they're capable of, of what the position requires of them. And here's the thing. I don't look at that person and think that person isn't capable, right? I think that person has no idea their capacity for work no idea what they could produce if they put it in second, third, fourth gear. Is that you is what I want to ask. People ask me all the time, how do you get so much work done? And here's what I'm starting to think. I used to think, well, I just work really smart and really efficiently, but maybe it's because you're questioning how much work I can get done because maybe you don't have a good enough work ethic. Maybe you're not going to work. Is that you? Are you something to listen? I'm not telling you to work. So you'll toil away and feel terrible. I had a job, you guys. I had a job when I was in uh, high school. I applied for this job where I was going into a dental office and I was helping the woman file files. They had like these, this huge file, like on the wall. And I would go in and file like stacks and stacks of files every day. And I was exhausted after doing that job because it couldn't have been a worse job for me. But I will tell you that I went to work. I got everything filed. I filed it accurately. I did, right? I was like the perfect employee, even though it wasn't the right work for me. So I understand a lot of you guys may be in a job that isn't the right work for you where you have to do so much thought work to stay positive in order to get it done that it's more exhausting than if you were in a job that fit. But I will tell you, regardless of whether you're in a job that fits your personality or not, you guys got to learn. Some of y'all need to learn how to go to work. You got to stop being so soft. Seriously, you got to go to work. So I've had some people come work for me and they, you know, they want to talk about when are their days off? When can they have a break? When can they get off? Can they get off early? All the, you know, how much do I have to work? This is such a burden. And I don't understand that. Like when I go to work, I'm like, how can I serve you? You are my boss. You're paying me money. I am in, I am going to do the job you hired me to do. And not everybody is thinking that way. Now I was thinking about this. A lot of you guys are entrepreneurs. So you're the boss and you're the employee, right? So you are making excuses to yourself as the boss. You're making up reasons why you can't do it. Now, listen, when someone works for me and they're like, hey, I need to take off early. I don't feel well. I need to, you know, go take care of this with my husband or I'm like, "Uh, please, 
I want you to be able to regulate your own time. I don't want to be the kind of boss that's like monitoring how many hours you work, but that's not a good use of my time or yours. I don't think like you, you have a job to do, do it when you can. Let's not talk about getting off early or not. You understand what I'm saying? So when you're making those excuses and justifying that stuff to yourself, like I listen to people justify stuff to me and I'm just like, what? I don't understand. It sounds to me, this is what I was telling Chris. It sounds to me like you don't even want to work. And then I looked at Chris, I'm like, do you think people don't want to work? And he's like, yeah, I think people just do it because they have to. And we're like, what? That's crazy. So I told Chris, I said, listen, I only want people working around me, working for me, working at the life coach school that really want to work that want to put their head on the pillow after a hard day's work. Because I felt that way always when I was working for other people. And listen, I never cared. Whatever you want me to do, I'm in. That's the other thing. Like, I'm not too good to do anything. I'll make you an Excel spreadsheet. Remember when I was working for Teresa at at, uh, Hewlett Packard? And she was like, hey, do you mind? I'm like, listen, I don't mind anything. Anything you need me to do in this job, I am in. I will do it. I got promoted faster than anybody else in that corporation. Chris had been there for 18 years, 18 years. He started from the bottom and worked his way up. I had the same level that he had. It was like level 65. It had the same level that he had in three years, right? I was like, I'm not waiting no 18 years. (laughs) I'm going for it. Now, what's interesting about Chris is one of his issues, the reason why he hadn't been promoted more is because he had this uh, belief system about not having a college degree at the time. And that's the only thing that held him back. We talk about it now. And of course, he went and got his college degree after, but he didn't need to have his college degree in order to kick ass. But his belief system really held him back. But I'll tell you, I think that like one of the things that served me so well is like, listen, I am your employee. It is my job to come in here and kick ass for you. If you need me to get you coffee, if you need me to get you groceries, you want me to take your dry cleaning, you want me to do an Excel spreadsheet, or you want me to speak to 50,000 people, I am in. I am all in. I'm an amazing employee. And here's what I figured out. When you're an amazing employee for somebody else, you're an amazing employee for yourself. You know what's great about running my own business? I get to hire me as my employee. And I'm not too good to do anything. I'm not above doing really hard, menial work. I am in. Let's do it. That is the power of a work ethic, of wanting to work because you love to use yourself up every day. And whether you're working for yourself, which you guys know how I feel about working for myself, it's the best thing ever. I'm the hardest worker I know, and I'm the one that gets to benefit from it now, not just my employer. But I'll tell you what, I was just telling, Chris and I were just talking about this. I said, I want my kids to go work for someone else for a year. I want them to learn how to serve. I want them to go to work for the sake of working their butt off for another company. So they can compare that, what that's like working for themselves. It's so much harder to work for yourself. So much harder. My employers and the people that I worked for, they're the ones that taught me how to be an amazing employee. And I'll tell you what, Lynn and Jose and working at the ranch, those are the people that taught me how to go to work and how to have a work ethic and how good it feels at the end of the day to be like slayed. All right. I went on a rant today. Go to work, y'all. Don't be waiting for a handout. Don't be talking to me about time off and all that. Listen, my employees all get six weeks off. I give them time off. I want them to do their job in, in the time that they want. But what I really want them to talk about is like, what are they producing? What are they creating? How are they contributing? Obviously, for my sake, I want my employees to contribute to my business, but for their sake too. Like I went into HP and created, I was a procurement specialist in HP. I went in there and created their entire procurement plan. You know what the hell I was doing? I feel so good about that. I organized all that stuff. I went in there and looked at all those parts and organized. They were so impressed with how hard I worked. 
God, that's a great feeling, right? I love looking at what I produce in terms of work. It's such a great feeling. I love looking at what my team has produced, right? What we have produced as a team. I was telling Chris, we were like looking through all of the people that have worked for us this year and the amount of work we've all created. I'm just like, we are some bad asses. (laughs) We are amazing. Look at what we've done with such a small team because everybody knows how to go to work. Let's talk about actions in spite of negative emotion. I want you to think about the idea of positive and negative action. How do we know which is which? How is it possible to take action in spite of negative emotion when our emotions drive our actions? Okay. So I want you to think about, this is like all you guys going to work that hate your jobs. This is like a perfect time for me to go on my rant, right? So here's what happens. We don't change one model, but we add another model that drives new action, even when our other model is still active. So for example, I don't feel like working today. I don't feel like doing this today. I'd rather go watch Netflix. I'd rather go hang out. I'd rather call in sick, that kind of stuff, right? So you have all of that. Now, a lot of times you'll recognize that model and change it, but sometimes you just need to go to work right? And so it's action in spite of negative emotion. So you still have that old thought running. You still have that negative emotion going, but you create a new model to take action anyway. So we might have a model that's driving the inaction of procrastination and the feeling might be fear. So when we take action in spite of fear, we aren't actually changing that model. We're simply creating a new model while that one still stays intact. So it's almost like we've switched models to run a new model, even though the old model is still producing that emotion. We get that new model that drives the new action. This is why I talk a lot about how, even though you have negative emotion, you can still take action. You can still create the life that you want. You don't have to extinguish negative emotion. In fact, you won't ever extinguish negative emotion. Half of the time, you're probably going to be experiencing it, but you can drive new models and take new action, even with that old model there. But it's important that you understand that that's what's happening because a lot of people, what they try and do is take action against their current thought system and that will never work. But you can create a new model with the understanding that both models are active. So this type of work is really important when it comes to indulgent emotions and the emotions that we need to allow. So we're getting into advanced territory here, but so many of you have listened to me for so long. I want to make sure you're able to go to this next level. So I want you to think about anxiety, over desire, deprivation, fear, nervousness, discomfort, urges. So it's important to evaluate your action based on the thought and feeling that accurately drove it. So a lot of times people will say to me, I overate and I beat myself up for it. So I went and worked out. That's actually two different models. Okay. The overeating model is where overeating is in the A line. And the next model working out is in the A line. Those are two different models. So you may feel shameful for overeating. You may feel upset for overeating and you may still feel shameful for overeating, but what's driving you to go work out is not the shame. What's driving you to go work out is your desire to get out of the shame. And it's important to separate those two models. Judging actions negatively to use against yourself has zero upside. It's a thought loop that so many of my clients get caught up in. They inadvertently create evidence for negative thought patterns. When you refuse to judge or beat yourself up, you can put a quick end to these types of thought loops. So even though you still have this negative thought loop and you know that you're beating yourself up for how you're believing about yourself and you may not be able to extinguish that model right away or get rid of it right away, that's okay because you can create a new model 
not to replace this one. And that's the big distinction, right? A lot of us try to pretend like that first model isn't there and try to replace it. What I'm suggesting here is that you have the two models and you take action in spite of it, of both models. The goal is to use your action to serve you in everything you want. You're going to have half your feelings be negative, but that doesn't mean you need or should take action on those feelings unconsciously. Some negative feelings have appropriate action that you want to take, but with feelings you allow, you don't want to take action and react to those emotions. So the way that it applies to my rant today and the way that I want to talk to you about it is I want you to really think about getting up and going to work. Even if you don't feel like it, even if you're tired, even if you're sad, even if you're scared, even if you're worried. And the reason why I want you to go to work is not for your boss. And I'm not talking about showing up at work. (laughs) I know a lot of you show up at work. I'm talking about producing at the highest level you're capable of. I'm talking about going to work, my friends, going to work. I want one of you from just listening to this podcast that just been going in, doing your time, just been trying to get through so you can retire, just been biding your hours, trying to get as much days off as possible, right? I want you to go in and completely revamp your work ethic and start producing at the highest level. I want you to blow your boss's mind. And I'm not talking, listen to me, I am not talking about putting in extra hours. I am not talking about working more time and burning yourself out. I'm talking about producing at the highest level you're capable of for your own sake, getting over yourself and your excuses and feeling bad for yourself and diving in to taking full action for your own benefit to make a contribution. That is what I'm talking about, my friends. I want you to experience that. And then I want you to produce at the level that creates so much value in the world that that value comes back to you. Yes, in the form of cash, in the form of promotions, in the form of a higher salary, getting the job that you actually really genuinely want. That's what I'm talking about. Don't, don't, don't give in to hedonism and false pleasure and laziness because you are the one that won't benefit from it. Your potential, some of you, now some of you, this is falling on deaf ears, right? Some of you, this isn't for you. Some of you already work your butts off and contribute a tremendous amount, but there are a lot of you that think you have a great work ethic that you really genuinely don't. Most of you can double down. Most of you. And I just want to offer, you're either going to end up like Kevin Keene, kicking butt, taking names, producing at the highest level, or you're going to end up having someone complain about you and be disappointed in what you're producing. And that person will be you, right? You don't have to be that. Listen, there's so much stuff you can't control. You cannot control the brain intelligence, right? That you were born with. You can't control, you know, how tall you are, the family that you were born in, the way that you were raised. But you know what you can control is how hard you work, how much you contribute, the results that you produce at the level you produce them. That, my friends, nobody can tell you anything about that you can't do. And I will say that going to work and producing results not burning yourself out, but producing your results is something no one can take away from you. And no matter what you actually get back in return, I'll guarantee you putting your head on that pillow at night, knowing that you slayed, that you slayed, that you used yourself up today is the best feeling in the world. I really, really want, if you don't already have that experience, I want you to get that experience. I want you to taste that experience. 
taking action in spite of negative emotion, getting over yourself and your excuses and your tendency to be efficient. That's what your brain wants to do, right? Your brain wants to chill in the cave. Go out there. This is what Dave Ramsey would say, right? Go out there, kill something and drag it home. Get the sense of satisfaction from every single day going to work. All right, my friends, rant over. (laughs) I'll see you guys next week. Take care. Bye-bye. Hey, if you enjoy listening to this podcast, you have to come check out Self Coaching Scholars. It's my monthly coaching program where we take all this material and we apply it. We take it to the next level and we study it. Join me over at the lifecoachschool.com forward slash join. Make sure you type in the the T H E lifecoachschool.com forward slash join. I'd love to have you join me in self coaching scholars. See you there.